Hello everyone, my name is uh, Katan Sada. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Texas Tech Health Center of El Paso. Uh, I'm also a Cardio Nerd Academy Fellow uh, of House in Tehoven. Currently, I'm pursuing a general cardiology fellowship. I'm applying for this cycle and I'm interested in critical care and heart failure. I'm also, I'm so honored to be here today to talk about National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. My name is Pooja Prasad and I'm a PGY6 General Cardiology Fellow at Oregon Health and Science University. I went to med school at the University of Rochester, completed internal medicine at UC Davis, and I'm now in Portland, Oregon for fellowship. I am the Cardio Nerd Spin Ambassador for OHSU and I'm currently applying for Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Fellowship. We have a fabulous multidisciplinary disciplinary team of experts today to discuss the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative as part of a collaboration between Cardio Nerds and SkyShock 2022 with mentorship from Dr. Alex Truesdell. It is our pleasure to invite our expert speakers today, Dr. Alejandro Lemor. He attended medical school at Universidad San Martín de Porres in Peru and completed residency at Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Luke's and Mount Sinai West Hospitals. He completed both general and interventional fellowship at Henry Ford and is currently an interventional cardiology attending at the University of Mississippi Medical Center's Comprehensive Heart and Vascular Center. Welcome, Dr. Laymore. Thank you for having me here, actually. Dr. Sarah Gorgas attended medical school at Wayne State University, followed by residency and cardiology fellowship at Henry Ford Hospital. She is currently pursuing a cardiac critical care fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Gorgas. Thank you for having me here. So we'll begin with our first question, Dr. Limor. For the past two decades, survival rate in acute myocardial injury, uh, cardiogenic shock has remained low despite advancement in revascularization and supportive care. Can you share with us the motivation behind the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative and how did you devise the protocol to improve outcome in this patient population? Sure. So exactly that, right? So mortality and cardiogenic shock has remained the same for so many years despite major improvements in care. Uh, so this is a back in 2016, Dr. William O'Neill and colleagues uh, back in Detroit, they started this initiative. And uh, with the use of standard protocols and record catheterization, prompt impellus support and PCI, they actually were attempting to improve outcomes in this patient population though. So the PELLUS study actually showed uh, there was increased survival from a 50%, which is a like a national cohort to 76%. Um, and this is why actually the collaboration grew so much and became the National Cardiac and Shock Initiative, uh, which involved 80 hospitals in 29 states. This is so inspiring and we're glad to, to be here with you today and like you know, listening to you directly talking to us um, about this initiative that now it's becoming uh, something like you know, very national. Um, a variety of outcomes were studied in this uh, like an you know, initiative, including procedure survival, survival to discharge, survival to 30 days, and survival to one year. Dr. Gorgit, can you summarize the main findings of the study and what are the main take uh, takeaways? Absolutely. So, you know, we screened over 1,100 patients across 80 centers nationally and eventually enrolled 406 patients who met criteria for acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock. Um, these centers followed a very specific uh, shock protocol um, and importantly, highlighting the use of early mechanical circulatory support use uh, guided by invasive hemodynamics, specifically right heart catheterization. Um, one thing to note about these patients that we enrolled is, about, is it was a very sick cohort. About 25% of them actually met criteria for sky stage E shock. Um, and, and the reason that's important is because these patients otherwise would not have been enrolled in, in studies previously and are unlikely to be enrolled in studies uh, because of just how sick they are. Um, what we found is that in using the NCSI protocol, um, the outcomes were, were excellent. Um, so there was about a 99% uh, procedural survival rate, uh, survival to discharge of 71%, and 30-day survival of 68%. So in comparison, prior shock trials have shown mortality rates in similar patient populations of about 30 to 50%. So 
So the, the outcomes are very encouraging. Um, and, and we believe that, you know, greater utilization of the NCSI protocol uh, will help outcomes in the future and uh, help improve survival rates. Um, there are a few things that are important. You know, the care of these patients is dynamic and requires continued monitoring as well as um, changes in care if needed, according to hemodynamics. Um, very specific outcomes and, and patients, patients who did the best are, were those that we were able to achieve a CPO of greater than 0.8, uh, a lactate of less than four, and in those in which we were able to reduce the amount of uh, vasopressor use. Um, um, and then, you know, the last thing is that very importantly, we can't ignore the fact that the one-year mortality rates continue to be high in these patients, uh, emphasizing that there's still a lot of work to do in this area. Um, and we have to, you know, make sure that these patients have close follow-up, put them on guideline-directed medical therapy, and then if needed and appropriate, then refer them to our heart failure colleagues for, um, you know, early consideration of advanced therapies. Thank you, Dr. Gorgias. This is an impressive uh, data and it's first of its kind and definitely support like an you know, early uh, mechanical surface only support, especially in this sick population. Uh, you guys have done like amazing work. Thank you. Um, so door to support time less than 90 minutes was a primary goal of the protocol. And 71% of patients had MCS implanted prior to PCI. Right heart cath was performed in 93%, although to my understanding, this was not always, you know, this didn't have to be done prior to MCS. Um, in terms of door to balloon time, uh, it seems like the average door to balloon time was 82 minutes with an interquartile range of 57 to 114 in your population. Uh, Dr. Lamer, I'll ask you as the interventionalist in the group, uh, in the STEMI population, do you think that it's, you know, that in appropriately selected patients, this delay to stabilize shock is really worth it? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So I, I, we proved that it is, actually. So uh, ideally, right catheterization, to just understand the hemodynamics, but if not, just getting LVDP and then putting the impeller up front, uh, we show that actually putting the impeller up front uh, was better. Because first you need to stabilize a patient before you start working on the coronaries. Uh, and yes, we, I mean, we ideally need to open the fluid vessel, uh, but those extra five to 10 minutes that it takes to place the impeller are actually worth it. Uh, you, can, you can safely actually open the vessel with support, um, and then you can do the right heart catheterization either right there or just afterwards to understand the human dynamics. Got it. And um, another question for you, Dr. Lemore. You know, unfortunately, our data is really limited regarding escalating support and cardiogenic shock. Uh, one thing I'm really impressed by is that, you know, each attending I work with might have a different strategy in terms of when to escalate support. And this also can also vary by field, but also within a field, whether it be heart failure, critical care, interventional, you know, each team member on a shock call could have different ideas on when we should escalate. So I feel like a lot of critical care care is just, you know, I shouldn't say just, it's, it's really the tough art of medicine. Um, but what I'd love to know is what, what did the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative look into this question and what did they find? No, yeah, you're completely right. Uh, I mean, the question itself remains unanswered. We don't know what is right, what is wrong. And then I agree, different, different uh, members on the shock team will have different approaches when to escalate and which device to escalate with. Um, we actually did notice that among patients that actually died of worsening cardiac shock, only 20% actually had escalation of MCS. Um, so patients that actually remain in Sky Class E for 24 hours, this is actually a paper um, published by Hansen, all really interesting paper um, showing that those that remain in Sky E for 24 hours, only less than 20% survivor. Uh, and actually those that are actually, even, even though they're present in, in C, D, or E, that improved to Sky Class in the first 24 hours, it's much better. So actually the next step for improving mortality in shock is actually early escalation. And actually Dr. Basir is leading the trial called ceramics. Um, so we're assessing patients uh, early in the cath lab uh, to make sure the escalation happens just before patient deteriorate actually, before patient are, it's too late for actually to um, up, upsize the, the device. Dr. Limor, another question for you. Thank you for this insight. Um, the cover vessel versus multi-vessel PCI in check in shock is a favorite topic of discussion among like an interventionist um, and shock provider alike. Did the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative look into this question? And if so, what did you find? Yeah, another great topic for discussion. Uh, 
And uh, again, it's, it's a topic of a debate. Uh, we did look into that actually and had a publication, Jack Interventions, about this. Um, we actually found that there was no difference in mortality or AKI between those undergoing culprit vessel and multivessel PCI. Um, in contrast, actually, what culprit shock that we all know the trial showed, right? So, so we believe that actually multi selective multivessel PCI in acute MI shock is appropriate, especially in cases that where you have more than one severe occluded vessel. And you're trying to actually improve perfusion to the myocardium, though. So if you have a two large vessels supplying a large myocardial territory, it's appropriate actually to open both vessels, especially if you're actually supported with an impella. And actually, what we saw is that in a subgroup analysis uh, by Sky classification and based on the strategy of uh, risk polarization, those in Sky class E had actually better outcomes when they underwent multivessel PCI. Um, which makes sense, right? Because they need as much myocardial perfusion as they, uh, you can give them, though, uh, to improve the state of shock. Yeah, I find this really fascinating. I think that, you know, I, I feel like, you know, when I'm um, the fellow, you know, picking up a patient with a STEMI or even end STEMI, I find myself sometimes wondering how can we be so sure which one was the culprit lesion? And so, I, you know, this, especially in the, in the case of shock where, each territory of myocardium is so valuable. I think that these findings that you describe are, are really have the power to maybe even change how we approach revascularization in this population. Um, we're gonna close by discussing next steps. I'll direct to you, Dr. Gorgas. What barriers have you encountered in centers who have not adopted this protocol? Yeah, so so great, great question. Um, you know, I think every center and location is unique in the barriers that it faces when implementing protocols um, in general, um, just knowing about the protocol. And so we can do outreach and collaboration and communication to help with um, communicating the benefits of certain strategies. Um, and centers may be willing to implement the protocols. Um, however, there are further challenges. Me mechanical circulatory support is expensive and some centers may not have the resources to provide those services, especially now sort of in a healthcare system where we're moving to value-based care, a lot of people are in displaying concerns about the costs of certain services, which is, you know, which is valid. We have to show that the cost is worth it. Um, and then beyond that, we have to have specialists who know how to implant the devices, um, and then specialists who are able to take care of patients once they get to the ICUs. Um, and beyond just sort of the physician level, we need, you know, other, other staff nursing that are able to take care of impels and ECMOs and, um, and things like that. And so, you know, and I think, I think in general resources as well as personnel trained uh, in taking care of this patient population are, are some of the barriers that we face. Yeah, what a wonderful answer. I mean, I think it's, you know, sometimes we take it for granted, this whole team that we have, you know, we have a team at, at the academic centers where we train, where we have access to Impella trained nurses and, um, you know, obviously Impella trained interventionalists and ECMO trained heart failure attendings and, and critical care intensivists. But um, I think that, that that makes one of the, you know, that makes this initiative so important is that we really have to see how can this be applied, you know, to a variety of healthcare systems, and it, it might highlight um, the differences in, in our various institutions. Um, and so one final question here, um, I'll direct this one to both, both of you. Uh, do you see a randomized controlled trial as a feasible follow up to this initiative? Yeah, that's another um, excellent question. So, you know, regarding randomized control trials, as you can imagine, they can be difficult to perform in critically ill patient populations. But um, despite that challenge, they're very important in guiding us and, you know, providing us with the highest level of evidence um, uh, for our patients. Uh, fortunately, there actually are some trials ongoing that target this uh, particular question. So in Europe, um, the ECMO CS trial, uh, ECLS shock, and the uh, Euro shock trials are all looking at the utilization of ECMO uh, versus standard of care in patients who come in with AMI cardiogenic shock. Um, and then um, Denmark and Germany are actually collaborating on a study called the DANGER trial uh, that is looking at the use of Impella CP versus standard of care in the AMI cardiogenic shock um, population. 
Um, and then finally, actually in the United States, uh, the Recover4 trial has been FDA approved to also uh, tackle this question and with the goal of looking at the use of Impella CP versus standard of care in patients who come in with AMI cardiogenic shock. Um, so I think that there are a lot of exciting trials actually happening right now. And, you know, we're looking forward to, to the results of these uh, trials to further shed light on, on the management of these patients. Thanks so much for reviewing those ongoing trials. Thank you. We've learned today from the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative uh, this impressive multidisciplinary, like you know, effort. And how, what the future, like you know, lays, like you know, uh, like holds for us uh, advancing forward is it, very, like you know, uh, encouraging. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Gorgas and Dr. Limar, for taking the time to discuss the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative with us uh, again. Uh, congratulations on such a remarkable initiative and result. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you for having us. This is great.